Hello and welcome back to CKM Red Rugby League. We are back for another round preview. We are into round eight of the NRL and we have got some very difficult games to try and tip this week. Helping me get through them though is Luke. How are you doing, mate? I'm good, mate. I feel like I've got the third background in three videos for us, but we're going all right. How are you? Yeah, all good. It's an earlier recording, so got a bit of chance to get some sleep behind me this time. So, you know, everyone's a winner. Love that, love that. Well, I tell you what, we've got some we've got some juicy games to get through and a couple of uh, tough ones to tip, so let's get this baby rolling. Right then, so we start off with the Storm and the Roosters. Meant to be the big blockbuster of the round, uh, but the Roosters missing some key players, the Storm missing some key players as well. well one player in particular, Cameron Monster. So Riley Jacks comes in at six. We've both tipped the Roosters for this one. I think we've probably got fairly similar reasoning. Yeah, look, Munster, a big loss for, for Melbourne. Pappenhausen was just starting to feed really well off, a, off of Munster. Now, they looked good last week, but they had Cameron Smith slot in in the halves. Uh, with the team list looking the way they do at the moment, the Roosters getting back Tedesco, getting back uh, Josh Morris. You've got the likes. I mean, yes, they lose Radley. Yes, they lose Verrills. Yes, they lose Liu. But the depth, you look at Nat Butcher, who is walking into the starting 13 most uh, at most other teams. He slots in at lock. Tupanua, Far Mouse, Big Poser. Is <laughs> is back on the bench, back from his stint with the Warriors. Collins and Orbison on the bench. Um, good luck to the commentators this week trying to pronounce a couple of these names. Uh, look, the the Roosters outside of Radley really back to their back to their best lineup. Uh, the Storm, the Storm could make a crack at this. I think if they drop dra- uh, drop Jacks, bring in Cooper Johns. Uh, to make his debut and have Smith guide around a little bit, but I just don't see it happening, um, especially now that, you know, even with it being up at Suncorp, it, it could be deemed as, as a storm home game, but I just don't see it happening. Uh, Roosters, 1-12 to 12 for me. Yeah, um, I'm tempted to... I'd say that the Roosters buy more than that. I'd say that the Roosters are going to open up a scoreline here. I don't think that's because the Storm are going to defend badly. I just think it's just that they're not going to attack that well. I mean, you saw it last week when Munster went, that spark went as well. Uh, the creativity isn't there. And with you, I think if Cooper Johns gets a run out, I think maybe they've got a bit of a better shot than with Riley Jacks. Because to be honest, Riley Jacks hasn't really impressed in these opening rounds, but... Coming up against the Roosters, I think you've got a back experience over potential raw talent, unfortunately. So, I mean, Olam back back in as well. Um, he's going to add a, a good a good battle out wide. But I I just think that there's too much experience in that Roosters side. It's too much talent as well. I mean, you got Orbison in there. Worst case scenario, one of your outside backs picks up a knock. Orbison slots into the centre. You know, yeah. I, yeah. there's there's so many possibilities. They lose a lock forward, Tupanua goes in. They lose a back, Orbison goes in. Lose a forward, Collins goes in. There's just so much depth and cover. The only worry is potentially that you lose Jake Friend because, you know, his body's not quite where it used to be. But he's he's still going good. Still got a few more years in him. So, but yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go Roosters 13 plus on this one. Yeah, thirteen plus. I think you're ballsy on, but now, even if Friend does go, Nat Butcher, Butcher. can and has played a little bit of hooker previously, and you put Collins in at thirteen. It's an easy fix. Yeah, uh, and the other tip that I'm going to throw in there is that the commentators are going to have an absolute nightmare trying to separate pharmacy and pharmacy for are we? Um. It's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be there's gonna be a lot of confusion on that one, but yeah, I I don't see I don't see the storm winning without Monster to be honest. It's it's pretty yeah. cut and dry. The, the Roosters, as you mentioned, with Morris coming back as well, if they find the edges, 
it's going to be it's going to be a tough ask for the storm yeah i mean we'll, we'll see what they can do but i i just don't see it happening for melbourne no me either but, so we will move on to the next game then and that is the Raiders versus the Dragons. You were very close to looking at the Dragons for that one, but you've opted to go Raiders. I've also gone Raiders. They've gone for a couple changes as well in the back line. So obviously, Horsburgh is now gone as well. So one change in the forwards. So Simonson comes in as well as Oldfield. Curtis Scott dropped to the bench. That's a very suspect decision for me. Uh, Hudson Young comes into the second row and Tapane goes to loose from the second row. I mean, the the Raiders. I if if you're gonna drop Scott from your from your backs, you drop him all together. You don't put him on the bench because now you you've got Havili on there, so you've got you're kind of forced to play a playmaker, and now you have got Scott as well, who can realistically only play centre which means that at some point you are going to have to pull Oldfield or Simonson. It's, it's a guarantee. So Havili, whilst he can be a playmaker, has been playing lock and prop yep. this year. So that's why I think they can and will afford to have someone you know, like Curtis Scott who can, you know, I say can be just a player, but... As you mentioned, has only played centre throughout his career uh, on the bench. And to be quite frank, it, Curtis Scott sitting on the bench is why I chose the Raiders. Um, if he was playing and starting, I I was going the Dragons because Zach Lomax would have had a field day. Uh, I still think it's going to be close. I am more than willing to take the Dragons on the line on this one. I think they're starting to come into a little bit of form. Yes, they haven't been against some of the some of the premier teams in the competition, but you mix the fact that Dufty, Norman Clune, McInnes, Hunt, that that variable spine is really starting to click, along with the fact that yes, Canberra scored twenty four points last week, but realistically should you know should they have scored more than 10 or 12 no probably not um i i it's a tough one i'm going like i said i'm going with the raiders purely because i think they 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 tightened up that back line by dropping curtis scott and they do have depth in the forwards but i would not be shocked at all if the dragons got up in an upset here uh, like i said if, if that spine can Players they have been, and Vaughn and Frizzell can can produce. Then anything's on the cards here. Yeah, I mean, I'm very. I'm, I backed Raiders before the team list had come out, just because I think, and I said it in the round review as well. I think that when you come up against a team that's only got 14, 15 fit players, uh, and still on the bad end of a scoreline. I don't think it does you too kindly. I mean, I look at the Dragons lineup. Saab is still in there. He didn't do enough for me last week. Sims comes in uh, as Jacob Horst drops out through injury. I look at the forwards. I mean, you're only real talent in your forwards. You've got Vaughan, Frizzell, Fuimeona, uh, Merrin just back from Super League as well. Per and Sims, Ford. You could, you look at you look at the the Raiders pack and. Is a bigger, more physical pack. You've still got a bit of mobility in there if Havili is going to come in and play lock or even prop. Um, McInnes is going to is going to go to a lock twenty minutes in. It's the go to play at this point, so it, it becomes it becomes a little predictable because you've lost that edge of right. Okay, what are what are they going to do with Hunt? Are they going to bring him on in the seven and move Clue now, or what are they going to do? You know now. 20 minutes in regardless of whether they're up on the scoreboard or down on the scoreboard Hunt comes in goes at 9, McInnes goes uh, as a roaming lock and a ball playing loose okay. I'm, I'm a big fan of ball playing looses but I just think that it's lost its edge a little now and I don't I mean you even look to the edges you've got Oldfield and Simonson on opposing sides 
that's a you've got a pretty young back line there. So for me, I'd go Nickel Clockstad anytime try scorer and the Raiders on a even as far out as a minus eight and a half on the handicap because I don't see the Dragons keeping with them on this one. Well, we'll have a we'll, we'll have a cheeky look at sports bet for for the time being. Uh, I'm pretty sure just based on the odds that that line is more because they've mm. currently got the Dragons at four dollar ten outsider. The Lions ten and a half. I'd take that. I'll go Dragons. I'm going to go Dragons plus 10 and a half on that. Uh, and depending on which side Lomax lines up, I'm going to go Lomax anytime try scorer because if he lines up against Croker, Croker is essentially a turnstile for explosive centers. And if Lomax gets another cutout from Dufty, it's game over. Okay, then. So we move then to the next game that has split us. And I'm back in the upset and you're back in the Eels. So Eels versus Cowboys, the big noticeable difference to the Eels. I think it's the only difference in their 17, actually. Well, two differences. Moses out, field into the seven, and then Gower comes in as well. You've gone Eels, obviously, league leaders. Tough to back against them. It is, and uh, the, the thing that gives me a lot of confidence in backing Parramatta right now is that Madison played the six for quite a while, uh, jumped in at 5'8 when Moses went, had played 5'8 uh, at times at the Roosters uh, as well as his junior days and just looked the part. And Parramatta, you know, despite losing their key playmaker for... 55 of those 60 minutes still looked in control of that game. Uh, bringing in Jai Field, the former Dragon, a very explosive half. Uh, Brad Arthur has already said that Dylan Brown, despite being named in the six, will go to halfback. Jai Field will be at 5'8". Uh, the thing that gives me a lot of confidence is that Dylan Brown took control of that Parramatta side superbly after Moses had uh, left the field. And I think that he'll be able to do so again. Uh, David Gower coming on for Alvaro in the in the seventeen, pretty yeah, you know, a pretty like for like change for me in in that regard. Takarangi looked good coming on in those twenty minutes, and look, I just it, it depends on what Cowboys side shows up because this is a bogey side for for Parramatta. But if the Cowboys show up and play like they did in the second half against the Tigers a couple of weeks ago, the Cowboys win. I still think, though, that Paramount has got the, got the win in the back here. Yeah. I, so the, the thing that's really swayed me, to be honest, is the fact that there is no Moses. You've, the Eels lose a huge part of their kicking game. They've lost their dominant playmaker. You've now got... Brown, who's your free-roaming running half, to become your structured, rigid seven. And Field is going to come in and is essentially... He's not going to be much of a ball player. You'll see him at second receiver a lot. And the only reason that he'll be at second receiver is that he'll be looking to catch somebody out of the line. He'll be looking for a shooter out the line and he'll go the gap. And then it's up to Gutherson to get on his shoulder. Yeah, Field is a fast play. He's, a, he's a fast player. We saw it at the nines. We saw it in the, the few occasions that he played for the Dragons. He's he essentially didn't have a team at the beginning of this year. The Eels took him on on a gamble trial contract. He's got a lot to prove, and that's what worries me about Field because you've seen it time and time again. Players that have got nothing to lose tend to perform pretty well. In the same breath, though, I don't think that Field is really an NRL grade half, regardless of whether you're playing at six or at seven. And I. I'd, Maybe have opted to put Takarangi there instead. As you mentioned, Madison can play there, but you don't want to lose that mobility and that power in your forwards by dropping Madison out of your second row. So there's a few questions to be asked in there. I mean, this is your side. It doesn't... Mitch, they're not a, a one-club player. It's not Mitchell Moses plays well, the Eels plays well. But having Mitchell Moses is a huge part of that. Whereas you look to the Cowboys now, and I mentioned it again in the, in the round review, Tamalolo plays well, the Cowboys play well. 
McLean comes back in, a prop. I know that he played last week, but he didn't maybe get through the minutes that he'd like to. Hampton is still at 14. Tabio Ifido, although named at fullback, Green has said that he's giving Valentine Holmes every chance of playing and has named him in the 21 as well. So I wouldn't be shocked to see Val Holmes coming in. Um, Opacek keeps his spot and moves O'Neill to the wing. Lumalu is out of the squad. Opacek played fantastic last week. If Opacek plays like he did last week, this week, there's going to be it's going to be nightmares on the on the wings. You know his offload game coming to the line. You know he, he would even get in the fending on players. So I'm with you in if the right Cowboys side turns up, then I think they win. But it's just a case of which one turns up, or even for which half they turn up. We've seen that they have a really good half and they have a really terrible half. If you are, if you have a really terrible first half against the Eagles, you don't come back. I'd rather see them have a terrible second half and try and scrape a win. And that's why I'm I'm going to go Cowboys on a really slim margin here. I honestly don't think it's going to be any more than a converted try. So I'd, I'd if you're going to take any team, you either go Eels on a plus or you go Cowboys on nothing more than a minus two. Yeah, look, I, I'd be willing to take... Parramatta, four and a half, maybe. It's it, it's a tough one. I think that Sivo will storm over Justin O'Neill. Um, the issue is going to be that if Felt plays like how he did last week, in the rich vein of form that he's in, alongside the fact that he comes up against Ferguson, who is out of form, then I could see Felt going for a hattie. So, based on that, if you're doing a same game multi, Sevo uh, felt anytime try st- try scorer. If you want to start being a little bit, if you want to go for some value, um, I could, I could see Madison going over against Shane Wright, um, but Eagle uh, Eagles no more than a minus four and a half line for me. Okay then. So, then we move on to another one that's not the easiest to pick, Titans-Sharks. We've both gone Sharks on this one, despite the fact that the Titans got up last week. Um, I just don't see the Titans going two in a row. They've not done it for for years now. I didn't get a chance to look at how far back it was that the Titans last won two in a row. I think they've got confidence, but I also don't think that they'll get up over the Sharks because the Sharks... If they did what they did last week, and that's play to their strengths, Johnson coming to the line, you know, Graham putting in a few of the kicks, I I think that the Sharks run riot in this one. I could see the Sharks posting up a decent scoreline. I mean, the Titans have brought Peachy from the bench into the centres, so you've got Kelly in one side, Peachy in the other, Cartwright comes back in, and Jolliffe goes to starting prop and Lissoni to the bench which I don't get, to be honest, because I thought that Sam Lassone has been playing probably some of the best rugby league of his career after being labelled a lazy forward while being at the Warriors. He's come in and really proved himself at the Titans. So unless you're planning on using him as an impact, I think that that's probably a bit of a lost cause. So look, we've both gone the Sharks and it's not so much the forward pack over anything else because I honestly think that despite the Sharks having a more versatile forward pack, the Titans have the upper edge there. It's the fact that I don't see the Titans' back line playing like how they did last week, as you mentioned. Uh, Peachy in, in the centres is a little bit of a defensive liability, especially coming up against probably two of the strongest physical centres in Dugan and Ramian. Uh, Katoa, five tries in two weeks. I think he continues that again if he goes up against Don. Uh, Philip Sammy could be a, a game breaker here, but I, I just don't see it. The Sharks, I think, again, starting to click. They looked like they were having fun last week. Uh, I think it's the first time that we can say that this year. Sean Johnson starting to find a little bit of form. Townsend two weeks in a row with a try assist. It's been unheard of over the last year and a half. And I mean, 
That bench doesn't fill me with confidence. Bryce Cartwright, Jared Wallace. I don't mind Lasani on the bench as a impact player. And, and Tanner Boyd has offered a little bit in respite uh, of Mitch Rain. But I just don't know about that one. Um, the other thing that potentially goes against the Titans is if the Sharks go with Nene McDonald in the 21 uh, over Bryson Goodwin. That gives them a huge target to, to kick at. McDonald, I think, is 6'4", 6'5", in the same vein as Tupo and really good in the air. So they could take advantage of Don and Sammy not necessarily being the, the tallest uh, wingers in the competition and bring him in as a target. So, look, this is a, it's a tough one to pick. Um, I'm going to go Sharks 1-12 to and expect the Titans to back up defensively. But on offense, I don't see it happening again this week. So I'm I'm thinking what you're thinking, and that's that this could be a tight game, but I don't think it's going to be a low-scoring game. So I'm not going to go one side, one at 12 or 13 plus. I'm going to go over 40 points scored and Sharks to win. And that's because I look at the Sharks bench and it screams game tactic. And that's you've got Rudolph, Hamlin, Newell, Talakai and Hunt all on that bench. There's not a single mobility player in there. It's all big boys. There's a whole lot of meat in that pack. And they are going to rumble up the middle. And that's the plan. Because you've seen that when you play to the edges against the Titans, they do jam in. And they can play well. And they can defend pretty well on the edges. So I see the Sharks literally just trying to rook this one out. And they're going to go to those middles, those big middle forwards, your feet are... Your Woods, Nakora, Graham, all of those are going to make some big meters this week because they're going to try and dominate the Titans pack. Because if you dominate the Titans pack, the backs lose their confidence. And I don't see the Titans defense holding up if they do lose the middle. Uh, and like you mentioned, Cartwright on the bench, mobile player, great, probably not the best defensively or sometimes even for work ethic. Lasone, big body coming in, but you've got a nine on your bench as well. Coming up against a pack that size, you'd realistically want another big man to fight against. So, yeah, I'm going to go Sharks. Um, but, yeah, 40-plus points scored. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So, next game. And we have to caveat this one because this is probably the most difficult one to pick this week. Warriors-Broncos. So, at the time of recording, there is still no news on Roger Tuovasashek. He is staring down the barrel of a one-game ban due to a shoulder charge, but still named at one. I'll oh, confirm it for you. Roger's out for a week. Oh, geez. Okay, so just as we are recording then, Roger Tuovasashek is out this week. Will not play. Yeah, so I've gone Broncos. I get the feeling that you're probably going to join me on the Broncos on this one. I had picked Warriors pending the result of that. Now that I know that Roger's out, I'm going Broncos too. And again, I, I said it last week. I tip the Broncos with no vein of confidence. Thank you very much for convincing me. Otherwise, you sly scumbag. Um. But no Roger in all likelihood sees Beal come in to the side and go to fullback. Alternatively, Beal into the centres and Hiku will go to the one. I, I just, Roger's just too much for that team. He, Rod, Roger and Tommy Turbo must need back surgery in the next couple of years with how they are forced to carry the team on their shoulders. Uh, it just, I don't know what to, what to tell you about this game. I have no confidence picking the Broncos. Corey Pay may come back. Uh, he's named in the extended squad. I, I said it on the review last week that Oates needed to be dropped. And if I was Seabold, I would drop in to make a statement that he's done that. 
He's brought uh, Zarko onto the wing and uh, who is that? Reese Kennedy into Reece the Kennedy, pack. Yeah. Yep. I just... <sighs> the Broncos need to find a spark. They have to find a spark. And I don't know where it's coming from. The more I say it, the more the more I think about it out loud, the more I still think Warriors. <laughs> it's it's awful. It's awful. These teams are so hard to pick because you look at their previous meetings. I think we, we looked the other day, it was 19 in favour of the Warriors, 18 in favour of the Broncos and a draw. There's yep. literally nothing split in these teams and it is always a really close, low-scoring game. And I, I think it will still be that way as well. But I, I look at the Warriors lineup, and I think with two of Arsashek gone, I think what will happen is Harris Tavita comes out of the 14, goes to fullback, because you've got Wade Egan back this week, and you have Lawton on the bench as well. So there's your rotation playmaker. And then it's a toss up between Isaiah Papali and King Vunia Yawa as to who comes in and just adds a little bit of bulk to that bench. Because you you got when you've got Harris Tavita and Lawton on the bench, you realistically don't need that many playmakers. It's not going to make that much of a difference either. You saw it last week with the Broncos, you come with too many playmakers, you lose a forward, you're essentially up the old creek without a paddle. Um yeah. you, uh, and in the same vein as well, look at the Broncos, Dearden on the bench again, still no change in the halves, which does disappoint me to be honest. Um, Azarko back to the wing, as you mentioned. I this is the I, I think going the Broncos is the lesser of two evils. It's not that I think that the Broncos are a better side, I just don't see the Warriors winning without two of us a Sheik. And it's just yeah, less lesser of two evils for me. I just think it's that the Broncos are going to be less terrible than the Warriors are going to be this week. I uh As you were talking, I was putting a multi on, and I've gone the Warriors head to head on the multi. I don't know why my gut is saying Warriors. So I'm following my gut. I'm going to go my gut. I'm not joining you. I'm going the Warriors. <laughs> I'm tossing I... a turn one. I only say it because I think to Tohu Harris steps up. I think he'll lead this forward pack. Uh, Jack Murchie yeah. is probably going to have his best game. I'm calling it now. They have some brute coming off the bench in Hetherington that I don't think they've had for a quick minute. Uh, I kind of expect Cody Nicarima to target Milford and his soft defence as well. Mm. And if they do put Hickey at the back, he has previous experience playing fullback. So I'm basing this off the fact that Hickey goes to fullback, they bring Beal into the centres, and they all, to be fair, they also have Fusatua and Mamalo playing on the wing for the first time this year. Nick Rima and Green are going to have a field day kicking towards Izarko. He's going to bomb a couple. The Fuss and Mamalo will clean up. I'm going, yeah. with, I'm going with my gut. I'm saying the Warriors. Uh, I have such an abusive relationship with the Broncos. Every time I think they've changed, they hurt me again. And I, do you know what? I'm a, I'm a sucker for it. I'm going to go Broncos again. And I really have no confidence and I really don't want to because they are a God awful side this year, but without two of us a check leading from the back, it's it just doesn't seem likely to me. Yeah, I had a look Hetherington coming off the bench. He's going to be keen to impress because he's only on loan and he'll want to go back after a month to the Panthers and try and get himself a starting line, get himself into the starting lineup there. But you know, you got Carrigan back in at thirteen over um, Offer Hengawe. He's suspended now, out for three weeks. I'm going to say, and please, please don't get at me if this doesn't come in. I'm going to go Broncos to win by any score. Just Broncos on a flat. And I'm going to go winning margin 1-12. to 12. Any t You'd be better off going probably any team 1-12, to 12, to be honest, because of how tight this always is of, of an affair. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to go Broncos flat and any, and maybe Broncos one to twelve. Let let me put one thought into your head. 
and then we'll move on. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> Matt Lodge is in doubt with his knee injury. He has a history. Their bench currently is Deed and Flegler, Kennedy, Tio. Tio is a second rower. He's not a prop. Kennedy, eh, is useful. He's a useful forward, but is he potentially a starting prop? Flegler will start if Lodge doesn't play, but that means you lose the brute coming off the bench. Their current reserves are Oates, Corey Pay, Richie Kenner, Jamil Hopawati. Hopawati, a second rower. Coates, wing second rower. Corey Pay, out-and-out out hooker. Richie Kenner, a winger. There is no out-and-out out brute forward in that reserve list that can come onto that bench and be an impact. Uh, how dare you provide me with reasonable logic in such an irrational decision? <laughs> you did I'm that gonna... last week. <laughs> yeah, and look where you ended up. Right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Broncos. That's it. We're moving on. We're moving on before we get stuck <laughs> on this one. Right. Tigers Panthers. This one we found a little easier to call. Uh, the Tigers are in good form, but we're going Panthers. Uh, I mean, the Panthers look a better side. You you saw it last week. Clear is still managing to control the pack despite having a golf ball protruding from his upper forehead. You know, even a fifty percent fit Nathan Cleary still has the ability to steer that Panthers side around the park. Is just phenomenal. I mean, the Tigers are. Unchanged one to seventeen. Still no sign of Benji Marshall coming back. Don't blame him to be honest. Been broke to fix it. It's going to be tight. I don't think it's going to be a runaway Panthers, but I think it's it's probably going to be probably a try or a converted try or just a little more there. Yeah, Panthers one to twelve. For those who are looking for value, otherwise Panthers just head to head. For me, uh, Mansell back for Naden, who scored two tries. I think that's that's when you know that this Panthers team this year is the real deal. Brent Naden, who should be in the seventeen, in theory would be in the seventeen at the Tigers, taken over from Tommy Talao, uh, is now back on the extended reserves list. Uh, with Mansell coming in, Larry, like you said, e even with the damn baseball on his on his face, still controlled the team. Their forward pack is fantastic. I think that the issue that it's going to be is whether Luciano Leilua and Luke Garner show up like they did last week, or if Luciano Leilua and Luke Garner show up like they have in previous weeks and are kind of just passive after the first 10 minutes. Mm. If they if they play like how they did last week, there is a high chance that they run over big Billy Kickout as he starts to retire, and Ivan Cleary will have to pull the trigger on Billy Burns early. If not, and they become passive, you're going to see Cleary and Luai kicking the kick out from 20, 20 metres out and just letting them barrel through. Uh, I still question Matt Burton on the bench. Yep. But again, you look at their extended reserves, especially you know now without Hetherington as well. Mitch Kenny's a hooker. Brent Naden's a winger. Uh, Spencer Lanu. Don't haven't heard a lot about him. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to try and try and tell you that he should be there over Burton and Tyrone May. Really, May's just being May's being held out because Luai is playing superbly. Yeah. Otherwise, it'd be Tyrone May in the six and Luai on the bench. So, look, it's going to be a tight game. I agree. Panthers one to twelve for me for for the value bet. Um, but I would go with a North Luma anytime try, and the Tigers have been a little. Uh, Sorry, the Panthers have been known to give a half a try or two. So if you really want to value bet, I wouldn't be against playing someone like a Josh Reynolds for any time. You Reynolds usually pays about four fifty. But Panthers one to twelve. Yeah. 
I mean, I look at, I look at the two sides. I mean, you've got two quality hookers there. You've got Coruscant and Grant, who arguably are two of the premier breaks in the competition right now. They're playing fantastic. They're both in brilliant form. Uh, both coming to new sides as well. Mansour keeping out Naden was going to happen because, I mean, you, you saw the difference last week. The Panthers lose a lot of go-forward when they lose Mansour because he's cons- he's consistently their biggest meter maker. When you've got yep. players like Billy Kikau and Isaiah Yo and James Fisher-Harris and your winger is still your biggest meter maker, it tells you how well he does off kick returns and how well he does at building the base for coming off your back line. You know, when, you, when you're looking for a get-out set, Mansour's your man that steps up. So... I think the Tigers are going to have a hard time limiting the Panthers' meters. I think the Panthers, as soon as they start getting a roll on this game, could get away from the Tigers. So I'm, I'm, I am leaning more towards sort of the Panthers one to twelve, like you are, but the high end of that one to twelve. To be honest, um, I mean the Tigers. Again, you see it; they're they are somewhat of a confidence team. Once they get once they get going and get the tails up, they're going great. As soon as they start to slip a little, it's a problem. As you mentioned, Burton, you, they need to make a decision on Burton. Uh, coming up against a big physical Tigers pack, you cannot afford to be using 16 out of your available 17. You can't afford when there's 20 minutes left to play to go, right, okay, Matt, really sorry, mate. But you're going to have to sit this one out again because we can't. Like you've you've got to make a decision one way or the other at this point because otherwise, it's going to catch up. It's going to catch up with them, and in the late game, the Panthers will start to slip, and the last twenty minutes of the game will become the biggest slog of every single game for them because their forward pack will be tired, even if they pick up an injury. And now you've got Burton there. You, someone's going to have to do big minutes and you don't want kick out doing the big minutes because you've seen that he is not as effective as he can be when he is forced to do the big minutes so you'd probably take a risk on mine or as you mentioned pulling the trigger on burns a little early, earlier than you'd expect so the, i am skeptical the positive i think that i can see from this uh forward line for the panthers is they are very very adaptable uh, James Fisher Harris last year played the majority of the year as lock, yeah, and a very good lock at that. Isaiah Yo, never mind the fact that Billy Burns is a, a second rower. Isaiah Yo, you know, applied his craft as a second rower who can and has filled in at centre and quite well. Yeah, he he he, if playing in the centres is. The de- is the best defensive center in the competition. Uh, that leaves you Ted Avano uh, on the bench, out and out prop, Moses Leota, prop lock, Billy Burns, just a bustling second rower. And you know, they, I think they're still preset. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lock in Panthers on a minus eight and a half. That's that. That'd be my go-to tip on this one. I think they win. I don't think they win by any less than six. So I'm going to push it out a little. I'm going to go Panthers minus eight and a half on the handicap. Okay, so we move on to Sunday then, and we take a look at the Seagulls and the Knights. We have both gone Knights in this one. The Seagulls looked a little lackluster last week, and again, I mean the only big noticeable uh, return. Moses Sully coming back into the lineup adds a bit of bulk to the edges. You know, how much of a difference is he going to make? You look at who he comes up against. Uh, Ineri Tuala. I mean, the Knights, for me, look the better side for this one. The Seagulls just didn't seem to offer much in attack last week. And I think that's because they have just ran out of creative players, unfortunately. The. So the interesting thing for me, and it was said on the broadcast last week, is that they moved Garrick to fullback. Brendan Elliott has all the experience as an NRL fullback when Trebojevic doesn't play. So I'm not sure what the thinking is there, 
I'm not going to yeah. question it. There's a reason why we're middling NRL pundits and not coaches. Uh, but you're right. They they did not look good in attack until the game was set in stone. Nor did Newcastle, for that matter. They apparently didn't arrive in Queensland until the second half of that game. Uh, and I will be curious to see whether Manly used the same tactic that the Cowboys did of just kicking a touch to keep Ponga out of it. Uh, they get Bradman Best back, a big, a big inclusion after spending a week in quarantine in place of Shibasaki. SASA starts at lock, Salo to the bench. Um, Manly were just outclassed last week. They had a, you know, they still got the, the, the classic forward pack. Uh, they probably have the better forward pack over the night, but I just, their attack looked god awful. And if they play like that again, then it's just game. It, to me, it's game over. I've gone the Knights on the head to head. They're, they're really good value, I think, at a buck fifty, but you just, I can't see Manly getting up, even with them being back at the fortress known as Brookvale Oval. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at the Knights. There just looks to be too much quality through the team. Um, the Manly are not afforded that right now. So uh, the Knights looked awful last week, let's be honest. And I don't see them going. I don't see them being awful twice in a row. So even if the Knights play at about 75%, that's enough for them to get probably an eight-point margin on uh, on the Sea Eagles. I mean, you got Bradman Best coming back. He's got a point to prove as he copped a lot of flack for bursting the bubble, as it's now been known, and going to go see his family. I mean, the, the guy's 18. Leave him alone. Right. So the Knights do just look like the, the better quality side. The forward pack for me will dominate. I mean, yes, you've got Thompson, Siren, and Trevojevic to pal, as well as adding Fanua Blake, who arguably right now is probably one of the premier players in the comp, probably especially one of the premier prop forwards. They're coming up against Clemmer, the Saifiti brothers, Fitzgibbon, Mataltia, uh, and even Aidan Guerra coming off the bench. That's a big ask because those big those big game players are going to have to do a lot of minutes and the time that they're on the field, they're going to have to have the most impact. So I think if the Knights hold out the Sea Eagles for the first 25 minutes, I think the back end of the game gets away from the Sea Eagles and I could see the Knights running up a 12 plus. Mm. Yeah, look, I don't know about a 12 plus, but then again, you know, you see how, how they played last week, Manly, and it's you know, it's very much a feasible possibility. Um, if Best goes up against Parker, Best scores a double. That, mm. That's all I think I need to say about that. Um, forward pack, Clemmer, Saifidi against Fanua Blake and Tapau. That just makes your mouth salivate. Mm. But, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just wait and see see for that one. Uh, Manly, I think, have have the win in the back row with Thompson, Sirenin and Trebojevic. But I think the backs are just going to be too strong, too lethal. And the Knights, I'll give the Knights uh, an eight and a half head uh, head start. Sorry, an eight and a half line. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still confident in saying that the Knights run this out in the last 20 minutes. So expect it to be close for 60. Don't expect it to be so close at full time. So I'm going to say that the Knights... On, I'd, I'd say I'd take the, the Knights on a minus eight and a half, and I'd say that the score, the total points, forty plus. Yeah, yeah. And round eight will be seen out by the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs and the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Uh, we have both gone Rabbitohs in this one, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. Both of them. Yep. The bunnies. I just yeah. the Bron uh, the Broncos now the Bulldogs <laughs> looked much better um, on def. Well, I say much better. They got spanked, but they 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 had sparks of brilliance early. They had a very good start, 
And then, well, we know what happened for the rest. Uh, Dean Pay is now officially on the micro under the microscope with uh, Eddie Jones linked to the Bulldogs job. So that doesn't help help the cause. I think the dogs. They also had a couple that went down with injury during the game. Uh, Jake Avarillo went went off. Will Hoppawati, Karen Holland just didn't really make an impact. Those three are out with with Tenny Zalesniak to fullback. Smith and Montoya, Meany and Crichton onto the wings. Um, and then James Roberts comes in for Braden Burns for, for South Sydney. Uh, to me, it's the easiest game of the round to pick. Uh, barring an absolute, you know, self-destruction of, of the Rabbitohs on, on the field come Sunday night, Walker and Reynolds are just going to have their way with the Bulldogs. Latrell could have as bad of a game as he did last week, and I still have the Rabbitohs going 13 plus. The, their forward pack's just too strong. Campbell Graham's been fantastic. Alex, Alex Johnston has been a star on the wing since moving there. And, you know, I, it's just been a bad season. It's going to get worse for the dogs. I am saying that. The bunnies are going thirteen plus. Alex Johnston, Cody Walker, anytime try scorers. Yeah, so I, I look at the Bulldogs and the Bulldogs in their twenty-one. Luke Thompson now could potentially be set to. Uh, Carrot Holland's on the bench at fourteen. Carrot Holland offers nothing off the bench. You play him in the centre, or you don't play him at all. So I can see potentially Carrot Holland losing his spot, or even Britt, um to Luke Thompson. Uh, and him coming in, how much of a lift will that give them? Especially with such a, I think this is this is like their thirtieth potential different backline combination. I mean, with Teni Zalesniak fullback now, you've lost Hapoati. Marcelo Montoya comes in. Meany's back on the wing. You've still got Wakeham at seven. I mean, they're bolstered by the return of Tolman. Let's be honest, Tolman's yeah. one of their better meter makers. But coming up against a South Sydney pack that features players like Tola, Burgess, Sewer, Canberra, and even Siren and off the bench. I mean, Roberts is questionable off the bench for me. Again, another player, you don't you don't put a centre on the bench. You don't make any sense. You, you want a multi-tool there. You want someone that can come in and play tons of different positions and plug any sort of hole. So it's questionable for me, but I'd still see the rabbit was getting up in this one. And I could see it being a decent scoreline as well. I'd say that there's probably 30, 36 points in this game. I'm looking at something like a, a 24-8, 24-10. So I'd, I'd say you take South on a minus 10 at the very least, um, and you go for 34 points plus. On that one, that would be my back. Yeah, I could scarily, I could see that. It's uh, I think it's just going to be a massacre. It could be a massacre on the field. We'll see how Bankwest holds up with some new turf. But yep. it it's just going to be a massacre. South Sydney just going to absolutely destroy these dogs. Yeah. So. I think that's going to wrap it up there then. Thank you for joining us for another round preview. We hope that our tips can hopefully bring you some money. And if it does, send us it, please. We are in desperate need. So thank you for joining us once again. Drop a like, drop a subscribe. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know your tips as well. And uh, we will see you for the round review to see how our tips got on. We'll see you then. Right, there we go.